Hello everyone, my name is Genia Schoenbansfeld and I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton. What I'm going to do today is talk to you about G.E. Moore's famous attempt to refute skepticism and Wittgenstein's interesting critique in his collection of remarks called Uncertainty. The English philosopher G.E. Moore, who was a contemporary of Wittgenstein's at Cambridge, is notorious for trying to refute radical scepticism, the thought that we may know nothing about the external world, by taking something out of his pocket. So Moore stands in front of his class and raises his hand saying, here is a hand, then he raises another and he says, here is another. Now, if that's all that Moore does, why should we think that this is a way of refuting scepticism? Well, of course, because if Moore is right that there are two hands in front of him, he can know that he has two hands by perception, and consequently he can know that the external world exists. So we can formalize this argument to make clear the intermediate steps in the following way. So P1 is the premise, I know I have two hands. P2, if I know that I have two hands, then I know that two physical objects exist. P3, if I know that two physical objects exist, then I know that the external world exists. And so I get the conclusion that if I know that the external world exists, then I know that skepticism is false. The problem is, however, why should we grant P1 in the first place? And in particular, why should the skeptic grant P1 that I know that there is a hand in front of me? What is it that makes Moore so confident that he knows he's got two hands? And of course, Moore's answer is by perception, that is to say, by looking. He knows that there are two hands in front of him because he can see them. Now, the problems with Moore's attempt are, of course, that it looks like, as a response to scepticism, this is question begging. Because even though the sceptic might grant that Moore sees hands in front of him, why should that entail that Moore is entitled to conclude that he knows he's got two hands? For after all, there are various sceptical possibilities that Moore is perhaps not excluding. So, you know, if, I'm, if I've ingested a hallucinogenic drug, for example, I might think that I'm seeing my hands, but in fact, I'm not. Maybe I'm, I'm lying semi-conscious in my bed and I can't actually see my hands, in which case, um, I'm, I'm merely seeing a hallucination, and such a hallucination would, of course, um, not allow me to conclude um, that I know that I've got hands because I can see them. Even worse, if I assume, as, for example, the French philosopher René Descartes does, if I assume that an evil demon is constantly deceiving me, or to use a more present-day example of a radical sceptical possibility, um, if a scientist has abducted me in my sleep and harvested my brain and put that brain into a vat of nutrients which is connected via electrodes to a supercomputer, well then, you know, I might think I've got a body, I might think I've got hands, but in fact, I don't have any of those things because I'm merely a disembodied brain floating in a, in a vat of nutrients that a supercomputer is manipulating in order to give me the impression that I'm moving around an external world, that I'm moving my hands, that I'm currently standing in front of you talking, etc. So if Moore cannot rule these possibilities out, why should the sceptic grant that Moore can know that he's got two hands? And now Ludwig Wittgenstein thought that Moore's argument was interesting because it looks like such a flat-footed attempt to simply deny what the sceptic is asserting. Nevertheless, 
Wittgenstein thought that Moore's argument is interesting, even though he agrees that it's question begging as it stands. And the reason why Wittgenstein thinks that Moore's argument is interesting is because he thinks we can learn something from Moore's argument, even if it perhaps doesn't work as a refutation of skepticism. So in the posthumously published collection of remarks called Uncertainty, Wittgenstein tries to get to the bottom of what's right and what's wrong about Moore's endeavour. Now, at paragraph 20, Wittgenstein says, for example, doubting the existence of the external world does not mean, for example, doubting the existence of a planet, which later observations prove to exist. Or does Moore want to say that knowing that here is his hand is different in kind from knowing the existence of the planet Saturn? Otherwise, it would be possible to point out the discovery of the planet Saturn to the doubters and say that its existence has been proved and hence the existence of the external world as well. So here Wittgenstein is saying that um, doubting the existence of the external world, of course, does not mean just doubting a particular physical object. Because otherwise, um, if I'm only doubting the existence of a particular physical object, then, you know, if I prove that Mars exists by means of various astronomical calculations, then I should be able to show the skeptic that the external world exists as well. But again, the skeptic would not agree to this. Because it looks like the, the skeptic is not just doubting the existence of a particular physical object, such as a hand, say, or a planet. Rather, it seems that what the skeptic is doing is doubting whether we are ever justified in claiming that we know that physical objects exist. So it's not about this or that particular physical object. It's rather about whether we can ever know that there are physical objects at all. And to such a demand, it must be irrelevant whether we have good evidence for asserting the existence of a particular thing, for what the skeptic is questioning is precisely whether our evidence is ever good enough to justify asserting that physical objects exist. The problem with Moore's attempt, on the other hand, is that he's treating the skeptic's doubt as if it were a practical one, as if the issue were of which object's existence, namely my hands, which are directly in front of me, we can be more certain. But of course, what the skeptic wants to know is why we can ever be certain. Why is perceiving an object to be there good enough reason to know that there really are physical objects? So the skeptic would agree that it makes no sense practically to doubt that there is a hand in front of me, but he or she will nevertheless go on insisting that that in itself is no proof that physical objects actually exist, and this is of course what he or she really wants to know. So Moore's assertion, I know I have a hand, does not answer that doubt or show what is wrong with the skeptic's desire. And Wittgenstein thinks that's what we need to do. We need to provide a diagnosis for what is wrong with Moore's assertion and to show that there is actually something fishy about the skeptic's desire to want a proof for the existence of the external world. So that's what Wittgenstein tries to show in Uncertainty, what, what is wrong with the skeptic's desire. So Ultimately, what Wittgenstein wants us to do is to get to see that the idea that we should we could ever need a proof for the existence of the external world, because we can assume that its existence as a whole might be doubtful, is an illusion. So the thought that there is a further doubt behind the practical one is, according to Wittgenstein, an illusion. But an illusion cannot be removed by merely trying to refute in a direct way what the skeptic is saying. Rather, we need to provide a diagnosis for what causes the illusion to arise in the first place and to explain why people are so mesmerized by this illusion. And Wittgenstein gives us some clues of what such a strategy might look like at paragraphs 35 and 36. 
So he says, but can't it be imagined that there should be no physical objects? I don't know. And yet there are physical objects is nonsense. Is it supposed to be an empirical proposition? And is this an empirical proposition? There seem to be physical objects. A is a physical object is a piece of instruction which we give only to someone who doesn't yet understand either what A means or what physical object means. Thus, it's instruction about the use of words, and physical object is a logical concept, like colour or quantity. And that is why no such proposition, as there are physical objects, can be formulated. Yet we encounter such unsuccessful shots at every turn. Now, why does Wittgenstein think that there are physical objects is nonsense? After all, it's the kind of proposition that philosophers and metaphysicians in particular routinely come out with. So how can Wittgenstein say that this is actually nonsensical? Well, Wittgenstein thinks that in order for a proposition to make sense, its opposite has at least to be conceivable. So we have to have an idea of what it is that the skeptic is actually negating. And Wittgenstein thinks that in the present case, where we're trying to doubt the existence of the external world as a whole, we actually have no clear idea of what it means to say that physical objects as a whole don't exist. Because if physical objects as a whole don't exist, well, what is there instead? Well, the skeptic, especially the idealistically minded skeptic, might say, well, maybe they're only ideas. And of course, the skeptic could say that, but we're then going to very quickly see that he's modeling his conception of ideas on physical object talk. So in the end, what Wittgenstein is going to show, and I, of course, can't give you all the details of this case now, but what Wittgenstein is trying to show in uncertainty is that ultimately replacing physical object talk with ideas talk is only to replace one word with another. Um, the idealist um, is still simply helping themselves to the fully fledged concept of a physical object. But what they're doing is simply calling what we used to call a physical object an idea. But that hasn't really got us any further. So if we're denying that physical objects exist and we contrast this with the existence of ideas, well, we've still not really negated the existence of physical objects if we replace that idea merely with the notion of ideas, which nevertheless do exactly the same thing as our concept of physical object did previously. So that's one reason. The second reason is that Wittgenstein thinks that the expression of doubt is context dependent. It doesn't make sense to doubt if there is no context for it. So under normal conditions, when we're looking at our hands, Wittgenstein suggests, it simply makes no sense at all to doubt whether they are there. Because apart from anything else, if I doubt that I've got hands, why should I still trust my eyes? I mean, clearly, I don't believe that I have hands merely because I see them, because why should I privilege, um, you know, visual perception in, in, in this case? You know, you might, if, if you're willing to assume you might not have hands in ordinary circumstances, well, then you might as well also assume that your vision is defective. So relying on vision if I'm prepared to, to doubt in an ordinary context, relying on, on vision clearly becomes ludicrous. Because if we doubted in an ordinary context that we really have hands, well, then that would imply that we really couldn't be certain of anything. And Wittgenstein um, cashes this out quite drastically at paragraph 492. He says... What if it seemed to turn out that what until now has seemed immune to doubt was a false assumption? Would I react as I do when a belief has proved to be false? Or would it seem to knock from under my feet the ground on which I stand in making any judgments at all? Would I simply say I should never have thought it? Or would I have to refuse to revise my judgment? 
because such a revision would amount to an annihilation of all yardsticks. So if the skeptic is right that the existence of my hands in ordinary circumstances is doubtful, well, then I wouldn't just be making a mistake. I would be saying something that would throw everything that I have hitherto believed into complete chaos. So, given that that's the case, given that denying something central to our epistemic system, to our way of relating to the world, um, would throw everything into chaos, what Wittgenstein is suggesting is that we simply cannot believe that our relation to the world is epistemic all the way down. So, in order still to have beliefs, he's suggesting, we cannot throw the system in which those beliefs play a role out of the window because then I'm, as it were, throwing away every yardstick. And if I throw away every yardstick, well, then I, I no longer have a means of measuring the world at all. So just as a game, in order to be a game, must have rules distinct from the moves that they make possible, so our practices require an unquestioned background in order to function. And what the radical skeptic is doing is he's doubting our unquestioned background while at the same time believing that doing this still allows him to say something meaningful. Because in order to articulate his sceptical doubt, of course, the sceptic has to take it for granted that his, his words, doubt, external world, etc., still mean something. But if Wittgenstein is right that the radical doubt throws out all our yardsticks, well, then, of course, it also throws out meaning. So then the sceptic can no longer actually even articulate his doubt if we assume that radical scepticism is true. So the radical sceptic is, in a sense, sawing off the branch on which he's sitting. And this is why Wittgenstein says that the questions that we raise in our doubts depend on the fact that some propositions are exempt from doubt, are, as it were, like the hinges on which those turn. And further, it belongs to the logic of our scientific investigation that certain things are indeed not doubted. I cannot perform any experiments if I'm constantly questioning whether my test tubes and my other equipment exists. So in order to investigate some things, I need other things to stand fast. Or to use Wittgenstein's analogy, in order to have a door that turns, I can't you know, allow that door to be suspended in a vacuum. The door has to be attached to hinges, otherwise I don't have a door in the first place. So it's not that we can't investigate everything and for that reason we are forced to rest content with assumption. Rather, if I want the door to turn, the hinges must stay put. So what Wittgenstein is saying here is not that we are assuming that certain things are true, as the sceptic might say. I mean, the sceptic might counter um, Wittgenstein's argument that we need a background that stands fast by saying, well, OK, so we are just assuming the background. Wittgenstein would counter to that objection of the sceptics. He is merely making a logical point. It's not that we are making certain assumptions. It's rather if I want to have a door that turns... We need to have hinges that stay in place. You know, that is part of the logic of what it means to have a functioning belief system at all. And this is why Wittgenstein thinks um, my life consists in my being content to accept many things. So, you know, we, we don't constantly question absolutely everything. Rather, we are inducted into a whole system, but in order to learn this system, I have to start off by accepting many things. Questioning things comes later. 
but I can only question things if the background is already in place. So the background makes it possible, the hinges, as it were, makes it possible for me to then wonder later on whether all of, you know, some of the beliefs that I've imbibed are true. So in effect, what Wittgenstein is, is saying against the skeptic is that I can't doubt all of my beliefs at the same time. So Wittgenstein is having a fundamental disagreement with René Descartes, who thought, you know, I can doubt everything. And indeed that we should once in our lifetimes, you know, doubt everything and throw out all our beliefs, at least for the sake of investigation. And Wittgenstein is saying, no, this is nonsensical. It's not actually possible to doubt everything at the same time. If I try to do that, um, I merely collapse into incoherence. I end up meaning nothing. So what Wittgenstein is suggesting is that in certain situations, doubt becomes logically impossible. It simply loses its sense and point. If I get to the stage where all my yardsticks are annihilated, I no longer succeed in saying anything. So if we try to doubt those hinge propositions, we basically get an, an annihilation of all yardsticks. So if we doubt the most fundamental bits of our epistemic system, what Wittgenstein calls hinge propositions, well, then I'm just plunged into chaos. I'm, I'm no longer able to make sense at all. So whereas the skeptic thinks that it always makes sense to doubt, Wittgenstein is suggesting that doubts need a context. A completely context-free doubt, a la Descartes, is in the end nonsensical. That's Wittgenstein's new radical proposal that breaks with the epistemic tradition of thinking we always have to be able to provide further reasons for something. And Wittgenstein is saying, no, that doesn't make sense. We have to start with acceptance and only then later, in a piecemeal fashion, can we subject various different beliefs to doubt. But I cannot actually doubt everything at the same time and assume there is no such thing as the external world. That simply doesn't make sense. So in the case of hinges, doubt, Wittgenstein suggests, is logically ex excluded. There is simply nothing to doubt here. It only looks to us as if there were. But this is an illusion. And if you want to read up on some of the themes that I discussed in today's lecture, then please have a look at my book, The Illusion of Doubt, which was published by OUP in 2016. Thank you for your attention.